Our guest on This is America and the World is Derek Cholet. He's served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Obama administration and currently is a counselor and senior advisor at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Derek Cholet's new book is called The Long Game, How Obama Defied Washington and Redefined America's Role in the World. Derek, it's so good to have you here. Thank you for coming over. It's great to be here. Thanks. Let's start with the easy question first. Uh, when uh, history uh, judges uh, President Obama's foreign policy, uh, five years out, ten years out, what, what do you think the judgment will be? I think it will be a good judgment. That's why I entitled the book The Long Game. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I called it The Long Game is because I think President Obama plays a long game in terms of his approach to problems, his, his thinking of what U.S. strategy should be in the world. I also believe that in history's long game, Obama's foreign policy leadership will be remembered quite favorably. And uh, it's difficult today with so many problems in the world, so many challenges, the headlines uh, blaring so many crises, it's hard to see that. But that's what I try to do in this book is talk about the underlying strategy that President Obama has tried to pursue and the challenges to that strategy. So, so you're not sp uh, so, so much talking about a specific success, you're talking about an overall philosophy that he's brought into the Oval Office. Sure, and looking at the totality of, of U.S. interests around the world. Uh, we can pick apart any particular crisis and think about what we should have done differently, and I try to do that in the book, mm -hmm. honestly. I mm -hmm. served in the administration, I was yep. involved in many of these issues, but uh, when we look at the totality of America's interests and the position that America's in today, particularly relative to where it was eight years ago, I think unquestionably we are in a better place mm -hmm. at home and abroad to deal with the significant challenges that we face in the world. And that, to me, is the key question. It's not that the world is challenging, because we could pick out any point in history and mm -hmm. list a whole sort, or all sorts of challenges the U.S. is facing. The question is, what position are we in to deal with those challenges? Well, uh, as I was starting the research uh, for our interview together, I listed about 12 different countries mm -hmm. that the President of the United States has to deal with day to day to day, night to night to night. And when you talk about an overall strategy, uh, I gather one of his principles is that the United States has a new role in a new world. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about mm -hmm. that for a second? Well, sure. When President Obama came into office, all we, we were talking about on shows like this and op-ed pages was how the world was changing. China was rising, Asia was rising, the Middle East was melting down, and the United States was in decline in 2008. We had an economy that was in a tailspin, millions of people losing their jobs and homes. Uh, if we were having this conversation eight years ago in the fall of 2008, we'd be talking about a massive financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And abroad, things weren't looking much better. Bogged down in two wars, the United States identified with Guantanamo Bay and torture in too many places around the world. And so what President Obama tried to do is lift us up out of that uh, hole that we had dug ourselves in in the 2000s and restore our health here at home and put us in a better position abroad to lead. There are huge problems, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that we're in a better position if you go region by region to deal with these problems than, than we were in eight years ago. Uh, also, I gather that the president has a, uh, a very clear feeling about how we should use American military power. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes Obama is difficult to categorize because some of his critics will say he's uncertain with the use of force, he doesn't like to use the military, he wants to get us out of wars. Other critics on the other side would say, in fact, well, he's the president who likes to use force too much. He's bombed more countries than George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. He's uh, presided over this uh, extensive use of drones around the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much does he like to use force or not, does he prefer to use force or not, it's the way that we use our military power around the world that matters to him. And I think this is a president who has shown repeatedly, in fact, we're showing it every day in the skies over Iraq and Syria that we're willing to use U.S. military power. But he's also been very careful, particularly when it comes to the use of U.S. ground troops in places like the Middle East, mm -hmm. that, we, we, that we make our decisions very carefully. And I think that's one of the hard lessons that we learned in the 2000s. And I personally think it's one of the right lessons we learned. You say the president, uh, at, at the beginning of the book, and also just the way you end the book, uh, that the president has kind of a checklist. Yeah. And I want to take uh, some of those fancy words mm -hmm. and get it down to uh, mm -hmm. things that I can understand. Mm -hmm. uh, that he thinks of foreign policy, or it, as you interpreted, as kind of gardening. Yeah. 
as uh, you can't fix everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's, uh, as you've just uh, talked about with the drone strikes, it's scalpel versus hammer. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of, that's the kind of way he thinks, I gather. Huh? I, that's true <laughs> for many problems. But this is a president who has shown he's willing to take huge risks. Mm -hmm. The bin Laden raid was a huge risk. The Iran nuclear deal is a huge risk. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to other problems, it's, it's not, often the debate tries to pin them down as all or nothing. You know, we're either acting or we're not acting, mm -hmm. or we're invading a country, or we're standing aside and letting terrible things happen. When, in fact, the policy-making process and the, the dilemmas inside the government are in between. And mm -hmm. it's trying to deal with the trade-offs and all these choices that leaders must make, both in terms of how we deal with particular problems and then also how those problems relate to the other things we're trying to do around the world. How do folks uh, in, 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 in your position and inside the White House, inside the State Department, inside the Defense Department, mm -hmm. you've been part of all of those, mm -hmm. Uh, when the criticism comes back that the president is weak mm -hmm. or he's an apologist or the United States today under his watch is less feared, less mm -hmm. respected, how, how, do you, how do you folks answer that? Well, if, first, it's a lot of it's politics and you sort of, particularly when you're serving in government, you understand that this is often just politics. But I also think what President Obama has been trying to do is, is address a deeper question about how we should think about American strength how we should think about decisiveness. Uh, and I think, again, I would argue that we're in a stronger position today in terms of the health of our economy, in terms of the strength mm -hmm. of our military, in terms of our ability to bring other countries by our side to solve common problems. Mm -hmm. There have been times where critics uh, at home and abroad want the U.S. to do more. Do more. Do yep. more. <laughs> yeah. As I point out in the book, more of everything is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to think strategically and make trade-offs and understand what your priorities are and try to allocate your resources accordingly, often it means you can't do everything mm -hmm. and you have to make choices. And what this book's about is the difficult choices. Some may, some may decide that President Obama made the wrong choices. I contend that on balance he made the right choices. Uh, I, I don't want to get on one side or, or another, but it is kind of interesting uh, when uh, talking about Syria, we'll talk about mm -hmm. that in a minute, uh, how, uh, or, or uh, a number of other uh, situations where you toss it to other people and have them uh, really consider it and, and voting on doing more, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden people get a little cautious and they start to back off. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is interesting. It's, and that's... I, what President Obama's tried to do, and I think it's a healthy thing for us to do in this mm -hmm. democracy. I was thinking about the red line. Sure, absolutely, yeah. is to widen the conversation and, and the sense of accountability and responsibility that we all have, not just Republicans, Democrats, but as citizens for the choices that we make as a country in the world, particularly the military choices we make. Let me, uh, let me take a little break. Uh, we're talking with uh, Derek uh, Cholet, and uh, uh, Derek is the author of The Long Game, uh, how Obama defied Washington. And I want to talk a little bit about that and redefined America's role in the world. And uh, this goes through every crisis of the last eight years and uh, runs down what was going on behind the scenes, what was discussed, and uh, also how the administration arrived at particular uh, policies that they took. A uh, fascinating book. Take a little break. Back on the other side with Derek. This is America and the World. This is America and the World is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S. China Education Trust, and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Petrolin Group, expertise with integrity in the fields of oil and gas, exploration and production, energy and infrastructure. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings and Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services. You've served in the White House, uh, State Department, the Pentagon, the Defense Department. Um, take us behind the scenes. What are those conversations, what were those conversations about 
vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Syria? Well, I think unquestionably they were the most difficult conversations that I was a part of during my time in government. Syria has been in many ways the crucible of Obama's foreign policy. And what I try to take readers through in this book is the journey that we have traveled as a country and as a foreign policy team in the, inside the Obama administration and as a president, as an individual, mm -hmm. and the difficult trade-offs that uh, the president has had to confront in trying to address the various aspects of the Syria crisis. And what I try to do is disentangle some of the elements of the Syria crisis from chemical weapons to Assad to ISIS and show how the United States has been trying to deal with those problems on their own. Uh, there's no question that anyone who was involved in Syria uh, previously or currently is satisfied with where things are. How many people are sitting around the table when the president walks in? Oh, it's probably 10, 12, and then there's folks around the, the bench. That's right. Yeah. Uh, staffers and, Absolutely. and second, Absolutely. second in command. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is it yelling and screaming? No, is no. There, it how, is how, very, how does it work out? It is, it is uh, the kind of discussion uh, citizens would hope that their top leaders have uh, in terms of its, the level of seriousness, the, uh, the way that issues are approached, the, the fact that all ideas are thrown out on the table. By the way, I don't think this is unique, unique to the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. I'd like mm -hmm. to think many administrations have these kinds of discussions. But I think what's also very revealing is that we don't have all the answers, that we are struggling with uh, these issues mightily, that uh, we are trying to understand how certain ideas that some may have uh, that, that are maybe echoed by those outside of government, how that may actually work. It, mm -hmm. Would it have the impact that we're trying to, to achieve? Uh, we look at the risks, not the risks, not only the risk in terms of the specific operation we're talking about, particularly on military terms, but the risk to other things we're trying to accomplish. And so when you're a president trying to piece yes. all this together, yeah. you have to see how it fits together, not just in terms of how we're addressing a specific problem of Syria, but how that would relate to other things you're trying to accomplish in the world, whether that's in Asia or stuff here at home. So um, uh, here's, the, here's the deal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, is it about 500,000 people have been killed? In Syria. In Syria. Roughly. Uh, about a million displaced? Displaced, yeah. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Madeleine Albright. Mm -hmm. And she says to me, I said, well, mistakes of the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. And she said, we didn't do enough in uh, Rwanda. Yeah. Will there be that kind of thinking? Is there that kind of, there is that kind of thinking yeah. about Syria yeah. right now, including Secretary Kerry? Yeah. Well, I try to think of, of what, are, what were the alternatives at, available to us at the time? And I talk about some of the alternatives that in retrospect, uh, I wish we had, had pursued, although I can't claim today. For example? For example, when we started the air campaign uh, over Syria almost two years ago, in mm. September of 2014, and I think it's very important for your viewers to be reminded that U.S. military power is being used every day for the mm. last two years mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in Syria. Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands uh, of, uh, of over 10,000 airstrikes, 300 U.S. special operators on the ground in Syria today. But they're fighting ISIS, they're not yeah. fighting Assad. Right, right, right. So once we started to conduct the air campaign, we could have taken greater risk in some of the targets we were hitting, perhaps start to hit some regime targets. But ah. the, 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 the challenge though, and this, these are the tough questions the president would ask, is how do we prevent escalation? How do we ensure that we don't get ourselves back in the situation that we as a country have worked hard to get out of from the 2000s in Iraq. Iraq and, and, some, and Afghanistan as well. And, and so that's the, that's the difficulty here. And it seems to me that whereas none of us uh, is satisfied in any way with where Syria is today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I visited the refugee camps uh, in Jordan. Good for you. Uh, I, yeah. And that was, that was three years ago. And I know they're much worse today than they were three years ago. So the, the question is, what can we do to try to mitigate the downsides of what's happening inside Syria. We don't have a, a silver bullet solution to the Syrian civil war. It seems satisfying that we could just, with U.S. military power, go in and take out Assad. So, But that's, that could lead to things that we would regret as a country. Uh, I sat here on this program when Syria all started and said uh, Assad's days were numbered. He will go. Yeah. The president's yeah. thing was yeah. he must go. Right. He must right. go. Right. The policy now is Assad must be part of the solution. That's a huge evolution in 
a foreign policy. That's that's well, a huge. Evolution. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't think that accurately characterizes where the administration is. You don't think is. so? No, I think I think the administration's policy, as I understand it, it's not going to be a military it's, solution. It's not. It, the question of it, it, to me it was how he goes, and this is this was the difficulty of the Ob of Obama's approach to Syria. The, the strategy, even though it was the bumper sticker wasn't widely used, was one of managed transition. In other words, we wanted... You know when I wrote that down in my notes? Yeah. I wrote down mangled transition. But the question is... we In my mind, it's a nightmare. Well, and that's, that's where the policy debate lies. Because we can bring about a transition in Syria. There is no question. The U.S. military has shown repeatedly how, over the how, last 15 how, years... How, how would you do that? ...that we can bring down a regime. Oh, you mean, yes. We can, we can bring down the Assad regime we militarily. Did it, we did it in Libya. We did it in Afghanistan, we did it in Iraq, we did it in Libya. But none, none of those transitions look particularly managed. So what the, right. what the administration's been trying to do mm -hmm. is seek a transition in Syria to get Assad to go in a way that's negotiated. Now, that's been very difficult. Some might say that's an impossible task. So then what are we left with? Now, there are some, and I'm, I'm one of them, but there are some who would suggest uh, certain military measures we could take to increase the pressure on Assad. What would be that? But, Give well, me an example. in terms of the targets we hit. Ah, yes, right? okay. We, we could, it said, we are bombing Syria every day. So it's not a question of capability. Ah. It's a question of risk. And the risk the president is very correctly warning of and, and, and worried about and is the risk that it would war. lead to something much worse where we are accountable for everything that happens in Syria from here on out at the expense of other things we're trying to do around the world. What would you say is the president's uh, number one success in the area of foreign policy? Well, it, it, there's a bit of a temporal aspect. I think climate change in terms of how, what's going to matter for our children's future, our Very grandchildren's future. Climate change is a big deal. Wow. Right? Good going. I think the Iran deal yeah, is, is, a, is absolutely uh, uh, critical. Now, we'll see in 10 to 15 years how well it worked. I'm confident that it will work. Mm -hmm. But that's a huge accomplishment. I also think there's a sense of restoring America's leadership role in so many parts of the world. You mm -hmm. look at the Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is more engaged today yeah. in different places, in different ways in the Asia Pacific than we were eight years ago. Are we going to get the TPP thing? We'll see. I mean, president, I, president wants we, it. President the wants Republicans it. want president it. President wants it done. I'm but unclear now, if the Republicans the, want it done. The it new, will, the new uh, potential uh, president, the uh, both of them we'll, don't want we'll it. We'll see. I mean, I, my understanding is the administration is going to try to get this done in the lame duck. So, Hey, a couple of things. Failure, number one failure, probably Libya. Well, I think I talk about Libya a lot in this book. I think see as Libya less as a policy failure than a tragedy. Because again, I look at Libya today, and I, I'm not satisfied with where things are with Libya. But I go back and try to look at the things we could have done differently. Everything from not intervened in the first place and allowed Gaddafi to do whatever he was going to do in Benghazi, to gone in, go in heavy after Gaddafi had gone with ground troops. I don't mm. think those either of those are very. Are so there, I don't. I don't know that Libya is one. Uh, I think. Are, are there a lot of people like you, Derek, uh, in those meetings that kind of say, "I, I kind of like the way you're thinking." You know, I, we could have done a little bit more here, or right. we could have Absolutely. done a little bit more there. So, so it must be. And that's often with how the policy de debate plays out. And I, I'm not trying to minimize those decisions uh, because those little things really do matter a lot in mm -hmm. international politics. But. Uh, the debate is often in this fine-tuning, in this calibration that's, that's not easily uh, boiled down into sort of sound bites that can be blared on cable news or something. A couple of things uh, I, I need you to weigh in on. These, these bothered me. These are direct quotes in the book. Okay, good. We were caught off guard yep. in the Ukraine. Yep. And the second one, and, and that had to do with Crimea, right, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Ukraine. And the yep. other one is the rise of ISIS, mm -hmm. which you said we didn't appreciate how much the Iraq army had deteriorated. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when I read those sentences, I say to me, I say to myself, uh, we should have known. Mm -hmm. And what's with the CIA? Mm -hmm. And what's with our spying mm -hmm. that we are caught off guard mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. Should we have known? 
And you can't just blame it on bad information. No, I, I, we should have known. I think a lot of this is, partly I try to talk about the humility that those of us in government have about our ability to know everything. But that's and huge. You're dealing with it's, Russia it's, and you say we, we were caught off guard about in the every, U everyone, Ukraine? Everyone missed whether, and, and that was an intelligence failure. I mean, but then they were going to go back to say the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Th that was We should have spies th that, that are telling us what the information is. That was an intelligence failure. Iraq was an intelligence failure. Uh, and I, it was interesting, actually. I talk about this in the book. When, but as, but, but, but yeah. the, the ISIS and the president is calling it a JV team, yeah. and then you're saying we didn't appreciate how much the Iraqi army had. That's right. From 2011 to That's 2014, right. somebody inside should have told us. Don't well, you think? I mean, we, we knew that Iraq was not going well. We just didn't appreciate the degree of deterioration of the Iraqi army. That's one of the... That, that's what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's one of the things, <laughs> had we kept troops in Iraq, I don't think we would have prevented ISIS's rise. I think that's personally an argument I don't buy. But I do think we would have at least known uh, more about the deterioration of the Iraqi can army. I, we weren't can, I, can I get one more thing off my chest? You bet. You bet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, since you, you know you'll, you're going to be in the next administration, there's no uh, doubt about that. There's no doubt about uh, that. Often in the book, you refer to these wonderful speeches that Obama gives. Yeah. Nobody reads speeches. Yeah. Number one. Right. Nobody hears about the speeches. Number two. Right. Nobody reads newspapers anymore. That's number Except three. Except for me, I... <laughs> and me, President uh, uh, Secretary Clinton. Yeah. Sec this is her quote. We don't tell our story very well. That's right. Okay? Yep. Uh, I've read this book cover to cover. Yep. But here's the one that jumped out at me. To maintain support for our patient approach, the American people must understand, must understand it and have confidence that it's working. It is not enough that we do a very good job in ex executing policy, mm -hmm. one must sell it mm -hmm. successfully. Mm -hmm. Where in the team mm -hmm. have people come together and said, um, not a speech behind a podium, not a speech at the Air Force Academy mm -hmm. that will get no coverage and mm -hmm. resonate. We're part of the deal. Mm -hmm. We are uh, the president and the administration are, are kind of reporting to us. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the heck's going on mm -hmm. because I don't think the people around the president had... We go to countries where there are public relations people who are advising the administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about oh, uh, I, I, fireside chats? How yeah, about it's, sitting down and talking to the American people. You don't have to have an interviewer. Right. He right. is so, Obama right. is so comfortable right. with television. All he has to do is sit there and tell us, this is what I'm doing, Right. this is what we're doing, this is why, and this is what we hope to achieve. Right. What's wrong with that? I don't think anything's wrong with that. I do think President Obama has tried all sorts of different ways to reach into the, you got to tell us. It, you tell social us. media, doing podcasts, you know, doing interviews with all different kinds Can't of folks. Can't convince me, Derek. Can't convince kind. me. But this, is, but this is one of the challenges we have in the conduct of our foreign policy today. It's not an Obama problem. It's going to be a problem for his successor and his successor's successor. Will you tell Hillary fireside chats? It's, it's, That's all you have to it, say. It, it, fireside it, it, chats. Fireside chats. Fireside chats. Will anyone watch them? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yes, they will. Wrote every two months yeah. a fireside chat. Yes, they will. Uh, Obama likes President Eisenhower yeah. and Bush 41. Yeah. I thought that's fantastic. Well, that, that was one of the interesting things to me. Uh, again, in writing this book, I had a chance to sit back for a year and reflect on what I experienced in government and think about President Obama historically. And so one of the ways I figured it would be useful to try to measure him historically is to compare him to other presidents. And the two presidents that he talks the most about in terms of foreign policy are George H.W. Bush right. and Dwight Eisenhower. What's interesting, it's just kind of a statement on our current politics right now, I can't think of any national Republican figure who would claim that they want to have a foreign policy like George H.W. Bush and yeah. Dwight Eisenhower, but you yeah. have a Democratic president who yeah. does. And that's and interesting in and of itself. We are coming down to the end of our time. Uh, I like uh, the fact that he has a, a checklist. I like this idea that he's kind of the, 
the Warren Buffett yeah. of foreign policy, right. that, that he's, he's not like the day trader right. in and out, right. Washington right. kind of right. do more establishment. Um, you say, as you end the book, the next president will have her challenges. Mm -hmm. Her challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you're out of the limb there now. Uh, but good for you, huh? I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. the way you feel. That's the way you mm -hmm. see it. Huh? That's why. That's the way I hope. Yeah, that's what I hope. My lord, uh, what last thought do you want to give us? Uh, Fifteen seconds. Well, I mean, what I hope that we can learn from the Obama years, and when we think about his successor, uh, is the challenge the U.S. faces in the world. And it's not that the, we're going to make solve problems instantly, but how can we be in a the best position possible to try to address these problems, bring countries together to make people's lives better. And I think we're in a better place today. I hope we can continue that. The Long Game. Derek, terrific book. Thank you. I really Thank you appreciate for the it. interview. Thank you. Thank you very much. For information about This Is America and the World and to watch all of our programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and look for us on Facebook and Twitter. This is America and the World is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and F.Y. Chang Foundation, guided by Ambassador Julia Chang Block, President. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Petrolin Group, expertise with integrity in the fields of oil and gas, exploration and production, energy and infrastructure. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing and distribution services.